11 years ago this month, filmmaker Morgan Spurlock undertook an experiment. For a 30-day period, he ate his meals solely at McDonald's, sampling every item on the menu. He estimated his daily intake amounted to 5,000 kilocalories. Over the month, he gained 24 and a half pounds, hence the name of the accompanying documentary, Super Size Me. He experienced mood swings, sexual dysfunction, and fat accumulation in his liver. Afterwards, it took him 14 months to lose the weight gained from his one-month experiment. He convincingly made the point that unwise choices in diet shape our future in a most undesirable manner. Currently, the Winter Olympics are underway in Sochi, Russia, until the 23rd. We'll be watching the fittest athletes in the world compete for gold medals in all kinds of winter sports that require a combination of strength, stamina, and dexterity. Now, how many of those athletes do you suppose follow the same eating habits that supersized Morgan Spurlock? <laughs> what would you like your life to be? Olympic sized or supersized? What if we look at your current spiritual diet? How would it stack up? Is your soul eking out an existence only on junk food? Or when it comes to the spiritual life, do you have a motivation and discipline and enthusiasm that would match an Olympic athlete's? To put the comparison another way, do, do we want to be supersized or sanctified? Last Sunday's benediction, I referred to Revelation 5.10. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. The work of priests is to be God's representatives and to deal with holy things. Does God really expect us to be involved in sanctifying things here on earth? Paul writes in 1 Timothy 4, 5, that things God created are to be received with thanksgiving because they are consecrated or sanctified by the word of God and prayer. We're to be about the business of sanctifying our world. There, that's an Olympic size goal. To do that will take what every athlete knows she or he needs the right goals, coach, diet, and workout. Goals. You suppose the Olympians got where they are as a sideline, or because their aim was to have the, the biggest biceps, or to impress the opposite sex at the gym? No, to compete at that level, they have to be very focused on their goal to become the absolute best in the world at that particular sport. Paul's letter to his protege, Timothy, lists some inferior goals that were leading people astray in their spiritual life. Watching the Olympics can turn some people into couch potatoes, I'm tempted to myself, while it might inspire others to become health nuts, obsessed about their physical condition, driven to spend all their spare time at the gym, or even become anorexic in pursuit of a perfect body. Verse 8. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And it says physical training is of some value, and I mean. Uh, the translators are being generous here. More literally, it's of little value or small value. The contrast is with godliness being of value for all things. To focus only on your physical condition, whether athletic prowess or knock them out beauty, is to limit your life to being one-dimensional. It's really a short-term goal. Don't get me wrong, I'm not dissing the value of physical exercise. It's essential for health. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul insists, Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Honor God with your body. According to Romans 6, we are to offer the parts of our body to God as instruments of righteousness. Christians should have a very integrated theology of their body, being the best stewards of their physical equipment that God has entrusted to them. But physical training alone falls short on two counts. It neglects the other aspects of being human, for example, our, our spiritual, intellectual, social self. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, all those dimensions. And it benefits, its benefits last only for this 
lifetime. Remember Bruce Wilkinson's analogy of the dot at the end of the line? Our earthly life is the dot at the start of the line that goes on forever. And our eternal existence is the rest of the infinite line. What should be the goal of our life? What are we be, to be striving to develop according to verses 7 and 8, if not just a buff physique? Train yourself to be godly. Godliness is valued for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Not one dimensional, but spirit, soul, body. Not just temporary for a few decades, but eternal. Another wrong goal is implicit in verse 3. They forbid people to marry in order to them to abstain from certain foods. These false teachings may have had their roots in an early form of Gnosticism, which viewed the material world as inherently evil, inferior. Consequently, these warped teachers advised people not to marry and restricted their diet. By such self-imposed harshness, people attempted to manufacture their own form of righteousness, trying to impress God and other people by their strict asceticism. It's trying to earn your salvation, your great standing with God, by your own effort. There's a focus on externals, what's superficial, not what's really going on in your heart, and our need for what Jesus did at the cross. So Paul, in verse 2, refers to hypocritical liars, putting on a show. It's all on the outside. It's not genuine. So if we're not basing our confidence or hope in our own efforts or accomplishments, what's the right goal to be aiming for? If this were the biathlon, say, what's the right target to shoot at? Look closely at verses 9 and 10. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, and for this we labor and strive that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, and especially of those who believe. Another way to put this is, the reason why we labor and struggle is because we have put our hope in the living God. So the right goal is just that, hope in the living God, the Savior of all people. That's our motivation. The reason we labor and strive. The, the goal that makes all the hardships, the strain, the competition worthwhile. An Olympic athlete values quality coaching. Having top-notch, experienced trainers is essential for those who'd like to win the podium. In the spiritual life, there is an abundance of wrong <coughs> coaches who would just love to enlist you in their program. Verses 1 and 2, Paul reveals what's behind these errant coaches. He says, The Spirit clearly says that in later times, from the time of Jesus, the resurrection on, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Well, the forces of Satan are at work deceiving spirits. John 8, 44, Jesus said of the devil, There's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The devil wants to deceive you, trick you, make you think things are other than as God tells you. Last week, Devon and I were watching a generally positive and heartwarming movie, except that a lead character at a crucial point stated, There is no sin. Meaning that religion had just invented the idea in order to hold power over people. It's just like the serpent's lie to Eve back in Genesis 3. When you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. Verse 2 describes these demonic teachings as being channeled through hypocritical liars with consciences seared as with a hot iron. Similar terminology to the medical procedure of cauterization. Burning nerves so there's no more feeling. One has become desensitized. Or Paul may have in mind the way criminals were branded with a hot iron. They did this back then. They're cried emblazoned onto their forehead. Are the messages you're taking in through the media drawing you to become Satan's slave? Is dummy? I thought it could tweet or something there, watching the Olympics just briefly, but they had this one commercial, and then there was a minute of the Olympics, and then back to the same commercial again. Come on now, that's not exercising our mind. 
2 Timothy 2.26, but they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do their, his will. By contrast, Paul points out the good coaching Timothy has been doing and urges them to keep on training others in right technique. Verse 6. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters there in Ephesus, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Verse 11 urges Timothy to use his authority when necessary. He says, command and teach these things. NRSV, insist on it. BBE, let these things be your orders in your teaching. If you have a good coach and you don't pay attention to them, you're asking for trouble. Who do we allow to speak into our lives authoritatively, to give correction in sensitive areas? Who do you have being your spotter? Someone who's going to call you on your mistakes so you can improve. Paul noted in verse 6, Timothy himself had been brought up in the truths of the faith. And do you remember who Timothy's earliest coaches were? 2 Timothy 3.15 From infancy, Paul says, you have known the Holy Scriptures. Who was coaching young Timothy then? 2 Timothy 1.5 I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. Parents, you have a, a vital role coaching your children. The World Anti-Doping Agency will be actively involved at the Olympics though, through its affiliate organizations. Doping, use of performance-enhancing drugs, has long been a problem in sport. In the history section of its website, WADA notes, ancient Greek athletes are known to have used special diets and stimulating potions to fortify themselves. Strychnine, caffeine, cocaine, and alcohol were often used by cyclists and other endurance athletes in the 19th century. Thomas Hicks ran the victory in the marathon of the 1904 Olympic Games in St. Louis with help of raw egg, injections of strychnine, and doses of brandy administered to him during the race, uh, I guess. By the 1920s, it says, it had become evident that restrictions regarding drug use in sports were necessary. I guess so. You don't want to be a dope in your spiritual life. You don't want the wrong intake, the wrong <coughs> diet. Verse 7, Paul exhorts, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. Ingredients to avoid? Godless myths, fables, such as speculative fabrications based on the meanings of the names in Jewish genealogies or Greek or Roman or Persian religious legends. Today would be New Age teaching and the latest thing going there in the bookstores. Verse 3, off-track legalism forbade marriage and restricted diets unnecessarily. Countering the teaching of the Gnostics that anything material was bad, Paul states clearly in verse 4, for everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. What's the right diet? What are good intakes for those who would go the distance with God? Verse 5. What are the sanctifying agents that consecrate the everyday things of life? It says it is consecrated by the Word of God and prayer. A prime intake in your life should be God's Word. Reading through Scripture regularly. Combine that with prayer, talking to God, reviewing what he's saying to you in the Spirit and his written revelation. Verse 6, what had been Timothy's training diet, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching you have followed. Here we have both scripture, truths of the faith, and theology or doctrine based on scripture, good teaching. For example, I've enjoyed C.S. Lewis and Francis Schaeffer's books and John Piper's sermons and Rabbi Zachariah's podcast, they're always biblically based and creative application to life. Verse 9 refers to a multivitamin in verse 10. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. We have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men. Isn't that just the gist of the New Testament in a nutshell? 
Now, you might not guess it, but I come from a long line of uh, health enthusiasts. Well, at least two. My great uncle, Norman Christie, my uh, uh, father's um, mother's brother, who lived in Mitchell, five miles away from our home farm, could be seen well into his 80s riding his bicycle out in our vicinity <laughs> back home. When he couldn't ride a bike anymore, he walked instead. He lived to the age of 95. Nowadays, my 93-year-old father carries on the tradition by walking a mile or so up the side road at Monroe. Or when it's too cold, he has conceded to using a treadmill in his basement instead. They both recognize the value of a regular workout. So in the spiritual life, there are valuable disciplines that help us keep fit and in shape in our walk with God. You see a wrong or inadequate type of effort in verse 3, forbidding marriage and abstaining from certain foods. The kingdom is not about food. Yes, I know that's coming up. And everybody asks, what are you giving up for land? But that's not biblical. You can go ahead and do it if you like, but it's maybe a good check on <laughs> things that get, you get addicted to. But the kingdom is not about food. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of what? righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Likewise, in verse 8, physical training is of some value. Take care of your system and it will help your prospects for survival. So you can serve God a long time here on earth. But it's not the whole story. What kind of workout or training do we really need as far as living in the Lord is concerned? Verse 7 on. Train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness. Did we say godliness? Godliness, that's what we're he's really at the core of here, as value for all things. How do we train ourselves to be godly? It starts with belief. Accept that the living God is your Savior. Verse 10. The Savior of all men and especially of those who what? Believe. Have you accepted it in your life as rock bottom truth that you need Jesus? That you can't defeat sin on your own. And your only hope to make it is by his sacrifice to forgive you. And by his resurrection power to strengthen you moment by moment. Are you resting in that? Trusting in that foundational truth for your life and future? Because you're going to be building on sand. What else for your daily routine? Spiritual fitness training. Verse 5. The word of God and prayer. Yes, it is. It takes time and dedication and discipline, but there's a huge payoff. Else you'll remain a spiritual dwarf, if not a dope. What else throughout the day? Verses 3 to 5 talk about a certain attitude or, or conscious approach to life that will help us keep in shape moment by moment. Listen closely for a key word Paul repeats. It says, they forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe in and know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God. It's a Eucharistic attitude. Eucharist coming from the ancient prayer of thanksgiving before communion. Consciously receiving everything throughout your day with thanksgiving. To give thanks requires having someone in mind to give thanks to. So this is going through life with your prayer line open, like Brother Lawrence said, practice of the presence of God. Conversing with God intentionally about even the smallest things. Thanking Him. Praying without ceasing, never quite ending the conversation. I could turn into a constant and joyful workout. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Maybe we could put a little bit of a twist on Nike's slogan. It's just do it. For the Christian, that becomes do it all for God's glory. As unto him, a constant dialogue of thanks. I think we had an excellent... Uh, illustration of that, uh, the accident. Uh, young people were in there um, and posted, God had his hands on our vehicle last night. Life is sacred. Don't take it for granted. And then being able to pray together right after the accident. They took that awful experience and turned it around and made it a, a, a 
cause for thanksgiving to God. They're still alive, he protected them in marvelous way. The Christian life is not easy. Forget any prosperity theology you may have heard. That too is false teaching. That's not what the New Testament suggests should be our expectation in this life. Verse 10. For this we labor and strive. NRSV. To this end we toil and struggle. BBE. This is the purpose of all our work and our fighting. What's the purpose? Because our hope is in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, and especially of those who have faith. That's winning motivation. That's great.